an excellent uh, introduction. So we're going to change tacts and talk about uh, lymphocentigraphy with SPECT CT and then move back to PET and talk about uh, response assessment, particularly with some of these new uh, novel agents. So this talk is going to focus on SPECT CT primarily rather than uh, the different types of agents we have, such as antinomy, colloid versus other agents, or the techniques of injection. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose with uh, either of these talks. So sentinel node lymphocentigraphy has become the standard of care for patients with uh, melanomas over one millimetre. And this is based on a large trial published in the New England Journal back in 2006, uh, showing that if you were sentinel lymph node positive, your disease-free survival was substantially worse than if your sentinel lymph node was negative. So it's a major prognostic factor. How, whether this improves outcome is debatable. And there's an MSL2 study currently underway, which is randomising patients if you're sentinel lymph node positive to go on and have an auxiliary clearance to uh, having an observational approach and just using it as a prognostic factor. And those results won't be through until uh, 2022. So there's a little bit of debate in the literature as to whether this, uh, whether this should be standard of care because it is an invasive approach to get further information on prognosis. The patient may have uh, a significant pain syndrome afterwards or lymphedema, and if it only provides prognostic information, uh, you may not want to undergo uh, such a procedure merely to know whether or not you're going to do better or worse. With these new agents on the market, it may be more important to stage patients better, so you could argue that the relevance of a sentinel uh, lymph node positivity is more important to understand, but you could also argue at the contrary, as we learn uh, how immunological melanoma is as a malignancy, cutting out the regional node where the lymphocytes are going to perhaps uh, control your disease is something that you could also argue does not make much sense. So there's a little bit of controversy. This is a patient with an eyelid melanoma. These are the dynamic planar images. We can see intense uptake at the site of injection and some faint uptake in the uh, left side of the neck. Uh, with SPECT CT, we've got the SPECT image on the left and we can appreciate immediately on the SPECT this is a spec at 20 minutes, how much better the target to background contrast is. Those very faint uptake on the planar images show up as very intense activity on spec. And we can see that there's three lymph nodes in a, in a chain. Uh, it may also be that there's two sentinel nodes here, one and then a second chain going to this node. But this node here is clearly a secondary tier node or tertiary tier node and does not need to be sampled. So the Planar dynamic imaging can still be often useful just to see how many paths uh, the lymphatics are tracking to determine how many sentinel nodes there are. We're routinely providing our surgeons with these uh, volume rendered CT images fused uh, with the spec data and the surgeon's really like this to be able to localise uh, where to look. Let's take some cross-sectional images through this to have a look at this in greater detail. So we've got intense uptake at the injection site. And as we come down inferiorly, there's a pre-auricular node. And I have to say that some of the older surgeons actually find these cross-sectional images somewhat difficult to get their head around, whereas they very much like the combination of having a cross-sectional slice with this surface-rendered uh, SPECT CT overview image. And it's, we can also do a fused multiplanar reconstruction through this giving the surgeon a good idea of how deep the lesion is relative to skin and allowing them to make a, a more precise uh, surgical approach. This is uh, either a secondary or, a, or a, uh, probably a secondary tear node and we can uh, see how there's marked flare because of very intense uptake but if we wind the intensity down we can see that this correlates with a very small submental node. And one of the nice things about SPECT CT is very often you do actually appreciate a tiny subcentimetre node at that site, confirming that it is a, a nodal station rather than a site of lymphatic holdup, such as a lymphatic lake or a lymphangioma. Does this make a difference to 
patient management and outcome. And there's a number of studies now showing that SPECT CT is uh, very useful. So this is a study of 85 selected patients, uh, 51 difficult to interpret planars, unusual drainage pathways or non-visualisation. They selectively went on to have a SPECT CT and there was a clear advantage in over a third of patients, leading to a different incision in 20%, a different site of surgical incision in 10% or an additional incision in 6%. A, a similar study but in 35 unselected patients where additional sentinel nodes were discovered in 20% of patients, additional anatomic information in a third and an adjustment in surgical approach in roughly a third, overall leading to additional value of SPECT CT in almost half of the patients imaged and this group therefore recommended that it should be routinely used in melanoma. I've got a reference to the Evan Sapir data from uh, Israel, which is from 2003, from a decade ago, uh, just to highlight that SPECT CT with lymphocytography is not a new technique, and although being used more widely, it's been around for uh, some time. Uh, what's the goal of uh, lymph? One of the goals is to perhaps decrease the rate of false negative results. So this is where you go through the procedure, cut out the sentinel node, come back negative, but one year or two years later the patient comes with recurrence in that nodal basin. We define that as a sentinel uh, node procedure false negative because perhaps the wrong node was excised and we were incorrectly informed that this uh, patient was negative in that basin. And, and the results of false negative findings are surprisingly high, ranging from six to 32 per cent. And in that large New England trial that we opened, the Morton trial, it was 18 per cent, which is quite a high rate. And this, all these studies use planar imaging. And one of the hopes with SPECT CT is that we might be able to improve these numbers significantly. This is a nice paper of 700 patients where they looked at uh, introduction of SPECT CT. And this group had a very low false negative rate of 6%, which is some of the lowest described in the literature. But even despite this low rate, 50% occurred in the first year after the sentinel node procedure was introduced. This group had a weekly sentinel node multidisciplinary meeting where they looked at the preoperative images, the operative report and the pathology. And they could attribute the cause to either the nuclear medicine physician, the surgeon or the pathologist in 40% of cases. So I think it's important to work closely, particularly with the surgeons, so that they understand what you're doing very well and so that you can both uh, improve the information you're providing to each other, because clearly it's a, a collaborative approach is beneficial. This is data from a German group at looking at 48 patients, 20% of whom had standard planar imaging, followed by introduction of SPECT CT. And they compared the two groups. And what they found was a better post-operative aesthetic result in the group that had SPECT CT. They also found that they were able to decrease the operative time substantially from a mean of about 110 minutes uh, down to 40 minutes by targeting uh, the site to look at, obviously still with a probe, much more precisely. This is obviously better for the patient. And quite incredibly, they were able to do 75% of the cases under local anaesthesia because the SPECT CT provided such precise localization. And this is obviously a major advantage of this technique if you can convince your surgeons to move away from a general approach, which would be done under a general anaesthetic, to a very targeted approach. There's a lot of unexpected lymphatic drainage pathways, which can be very difficult to identify on planar imaging. I'm not going to go through these in any detail, but I'll show you some uh, examples. And this really highlights the utility of SPECT CT. And the other role is to identify the so-called interval nodes. So these are nodes between the injection site and the recognised nodal station. And these are often forgotten about, as highlighted in the subtitle of this paper. And they're very difficult to identify on conventional studies. And sometimes you're unsure if it's a lymphangioma, a lymphatic lake, or even skin contamination. But it is important to know because they can harbour metastatic disease. And in this uh, large series, 9% uh, had an interval sentinel node when they looked carefully on conventional lymphocytography. And they were half as likely to contain metastases as the sentinel nodes in the recognised basin, but were remained of prognostic significance. So here's an example of a patient with a back melanoma 
we can see drainage to both axillae. And we can also see an unusual pattern of drainage across the midline uh, to the middle of the back here. So let's examine that in a bit more detail, focusing on this node. It drains to a small node that we can see on the CT scan, posterior to the paraspinal muscles, and then a secondary tear node travelling into the retroperitoneum. And this is actually quite a well-recognised path of lymphatic drainage, and it explains why some patients develop retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, and that's a local regional pattern of spread, not a haematogenous pattern of spread, which may have prognostic significance as well. And here's this image in a more 3D MPR. This is the only non-melanoma slide I'm including in the talk today. This is a patient we've published who had a breast carcinoma with a prior axillary clearance. So this was recurrent breast cancer. And as you might expect for someone who's had an axillary clearance, there was drainage to an ipsilateral internal mammary node. But there was also an unusual pattern of drainage passing between the fissures of the two lobes of the lung and between the major vessels of the mediastinum to the subcarinal nodal station. And we can see this really elegantly uh, displayed on the SPECT CT image. And ordinarily, if this patient developed a subcarinal nodal metastasis, you may presume that was a hematogenous metastasis, but it's clear that it's a local regional pattern of drainage. And this is not to say that the surgeon should go and do a huge operation to sample this mediastinal node. It's merely telling us that that's the pattern of drainage. Uh, but this example is highlighting or improving our understanding of pathways of lymphatic drainage. This is a patient who had a uh, temporal region melanoma on the skin and it was draining to a uh, parotid node and you might expect that it would drain simply inferiorly but it took a very complex route where it crossed the diploic veins. We know there's quite rich lymphatic vessels that go with the vessels across the skull and then travelling between the middle and anterior cranial fossa down to the base of skull and then along the vessels out to this path. And again, just educating us about path, unusual pathways of lymphatic drainage. If this patient presented with an intracerebral metastasis, you would just presume that that was hematogenous. And again, it may be a local regional path of drainage. This is a patient with a scalp melanoma who moved a little bit during the dynamic acquisition, making interpretation of these images extremely difficult. We've got the SPECT CT on the, or the SPECT on the left and the CT on the right. We can actually see this patient's nodular melanoma on the surface rendered images. We fuse these together and get these really nice surface rendered PET CT images. The sentinel node uh, looks like a preauricular node and when we come down we can see a secondary tier node, again corresponding to a very tiny level 2 node on the CT. And if we come down a little bit further, we see an enlarged node on the CT without any activity or a very faint uh, accumulation of tracer. And this may be a macroscopically involved node which has now been replaced with tumour and therefore not functioning as a node and therefore not taking up uh, any tracer. And so the CT can provide sometimes useful information in its own right, so it's important to look for this. And on the basis of this scan, we took the patient around to our interventional radiologist who performed an ultrasound guided FNA of this, and it came back with uh, malignant melanoma. And we called up the surgeon and said, perhaps you should abandon this procedure today. And he wasn't too happy because he's got a busy list and he likes to do all the cases that are on his list because we recommended that this patient have an FDG PET CT for staging because a nectar section or even sampling of the nodes will be a futile exercise if there's distant metastatic disease, and this patient perhaps has a high a priori likelihood of that. And here is the FDG PET. We can see that this node, which is enlarged, it lights up very brightly, so replaced with tumour, no longer functioning, and we can see the last functioning lymph node is just proximal to that. So here's a patient with a 4 millimetre ulcerating melanoma, and as Andrew alluded to in his first talk, these, there's a role perhaps for FDG PET CT up front in this group of patients since they have a very high a priori likelihood of distant metastatic disease. And indeed it showed a macroscopically involved popliteal node corresponding to an enlarged node on the CT. And three days after I reported this CT, the patient presented for a sentinel node injection. And is this useful or is it a waste of time? 
Well, I would suggest that since we know there's a macroscopically enlarged node, there may be a role for excising this node, but there's certainly no role for doing a sentinel node procedure because we know that the uh, activity is unlikely to drain to this node. It's going to bypass this node since it's no longer functioning and go somewhere else. But the surgeon was insistent. He said, this is a very difficult area, and if it doesn't help me, that's fine, but it might just help me locate this node a little bit better. So we went on to humour him, and we did the sentinel node injection, and we can see the injection site here, and knowing that there's a popliteal node involved here, and indeed, it takes a completely different drainage path, goes anteriorly, and then up towards the thigh. So we've got the FDG on the left, showing us the macroscopically replaced node, and the sentinel node procedure on the right, showing us that it bypasses that node and takes a different drainage pathway. He is a patient with a back melanoma, and we can see that there's a number of drainage pathways. Indeed, it goes to five different sites. It goes to a right axillary node, a left posterior scapular node, a right inguinal node, an interval node in the back on the left, and also on the right. So what does this surgeon do? This patient's going to come out of theatre with an awful lot of cuts if the surgeon chooses to sample all these sites. So what's the role of a sentinel node procedure in a patient like this. And I would argue that in this sort of patient it becomes a futile exercise because they're all lighting up equally brightly. I think it's a little bit morbid to sample all those sites and we, our surgeons will normally abandon the procedure in this sort of patient and go, look, unfortunately there's lots of drainage pathways. There's no point guessing one of the five of these. Uh, we'll just monitor you in other ways. Here's a patient with a cheek melanoma, and we can very nicely see that the sentinel node is a supraclavicular node. And this was excised and was negative, but one year later, the patient presented with a big lump in the left neck, and this is the FDG PET scan showing a major recurrence in the left side of the neck. And when we go back and look at the SPECT CT that was done one year prior, we can see that the recurrence is very near the site of injection in the skin. And this is one of the limitations of the sentinel node technique and SPECT CT, is that there's very marked flare of activity around the injection site. And the sentinel node was actually just deep to the injection site, but couldn't be appreciated on this scan, couldn't be appreciated with the probe, because there's also very high activity at that site. And it masked the sentinel node there, which perhaps if it was excised would have prevented this occurring one year uh, later. And this highlights perhaps the need for some further advances in the technique. Uh, and there's a variety of uh, newer ways to do lymphocentigraphy, perhaps with uh, PET or perhaps with immunofluorescent imaging, which may provide some higher resolution, particularly for sites near the injection site. So I think the advantages of SPECT-CT are clear. Uh, one of the aims is to reduce false negative results by precise 3D localization of the sentinel node and identification of interval nodes uh, or unusual sites of nodes that may be not appreciated on the planar study. We can also identify unexpected macroscopic nodal involvement on the CT. This is not a common occurrence, but it's important to pick it up when it is there. We can better direct the surgical approach uh, with feasibility to do it with local anesthesia decreased operating time and morbidity. Should we do SPECT-CT for everyone? I guess it depends on part on your local resources. Uh, we're increasingly doing it as routine standard of care. I think it's essential for patients with head and neck primary sites of disease because the anatomy is very complex and planar imaging is extremely difficult. It's very useful also for patients with melanomas on the back and even the arms. Uh, because the drainage pathways are, can be unpredictable. It's probably least useful for the lower limbs where the drainage pattern to popliteal and inguinal nodes is quite predictable. But there are a small group of patients which drain to iliac or obturator nodes. And on the planar images, these can look like inguinal nodes, but when you look at them in 3D, you realise uh, that it's actually deeper. And uh, it's important to know that. So thank you very much. That's the first talk.